Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the silver spot price over the Dow 30 index. You can see silver hovering around 1650, and the Dow is over 19,000, pushing towards that 20,000 mark. Now, you can also see that this is the most extreme we've had divergence in these two now, with uh, a close second being what we had here when silver made its new low on this uh, drop from 2011. But even though silver is not in a new low, the move in the stock market has been so big that now the differential between these two is actually the most extreme that we've ever seen. Now, I still believe that this is going to reverse, and I also think that the stock market is going to reverse down here, especially when we see what happens in the bond market. So I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the bonds and trying to determine what happens when we get uh, a bond market route. And I'm going to start off with this Robert Schoon article. He's a kind of interesting feral, uh, fellow. I'm sorry, Daryl Robert Schoon. And uh, he, he's an interesting uh, independent thinker. So we're going to read through this and then I'm going to discuss the bonds, the muni bonds and the treasury bonds. So this is just uh, recently after the election. Today's rising interest rates and trillion dollar losses in global bond markets are a prelude to what is to come, i.e. rising inflation with higher interest rates ending in the bursting of the global government bond bubble and the long-awaited breakout of gold. Now, this is a crisis comparison that he did, uh, the 2000 tech bubble uh, compared to the 2008 housing bubble, and you can see triple the losses, and will we have triple the losses again when this bond bubble bursts? I'm gonna, when I get to the chart here, I'm gonna show you, I think that's the case, and actually that, uh, that this, is a, this wasn't, 2008 wasn't the beginning of the crisis, but it was a precursor to the coming crisis. Last year on December 15th, 2015, the Fed announced the first tentative rate increase in nearly 10 years from 0% to 0.25%. The Fed had raised rates, had last raised rates in June of 2006, which eventually burst the U.S. real estate bubble in 2007 resulting in the collapse of global markets in 2008. In 2015, after a decade of unprecedented cheap money and virtually free credit to banks, Yellen's Fed hoped economic conditions had finally stabilized and they could again charge commercial investment banks interest a nominal rate of 0.25% for their debt-based capital. On December 16, 2015, Bloomberg reported Fed ends zero rate era signals four quarter point increases in 2016. The increase draws to a close an unprecedented period, etc. And you can see the chart here. Here is the long, long period of time where the Fed was either lowering, uh, kept rates the same or was lowering rates, had not raised rates. That was the first uptick. Because today's overvalued stock prices are supported mainly by Fed liquidity and low central bank interest rates, investors feared that the higher rates would negatively impact stock prices. On January 1st, an article in Forbes asked, will rising U.S. interest rates crush stock markets? The answer was yes. In the first week of 2016, the Dow fell 1,079 points, its worst start in history. Virtually all investors lost money during the atrocious month of January, sending the Dow to its worst 10-day start to a year on record going back to 1897. The total stock market losses in the United States alone was $2.2 trillion in January, just after 11 trading sessions. Bloomberg, Bloomberg estimates $15 trillion in net value has mysteriously vanished from the value of equities around the globe. On January 28th, Japan's central bank had to reassure frightened investors that the era of cheap central bank money wasn't over, and the BOJ then announced even lower interest rates of negative 0.1%. The next day, U.S. stocks closed sharply higher after the worst January performance since 2009. Friday's surge came in a global equity rally following a surprise decision by the Bank of J Japan to push key interest rates into negative territory. Some said that could push the Federal Reserve uh, to ease up on its plans to steadily raise rates. In 2016, because of January's shocking stock market losses, continuing economic softness, and other factors, 
e.g. Brexit, prevented the Fed from raising rates again as planned, but today, with only one meeting remaining in 2016, in December, another nominal rate increase is a foregone conclusion, unless, of course, another financial crisis intervenes. Market forces have already pushed interest rates higher, fearful that a Trump presidency will lead to increased spending, tax cuts, and growing deficits. Interest rates spiked after Trump's election. Donald Trump's stunning victory for the White House may mark the long-awaited end to the more than 30-year bull run in bonds. A two-day thumping wiped out more than $1 trillion across global bond markets worldwide, the worst route in nearly one and one-half years. The stampede from bonds propelled longer-dated U.S. yields to their highest levels since January, with a 30-year yield posting its biggest weekly increases since January of 2009. In global bonds just entered their worst sell-off in more than 13 years, market watchers Joseph Andolfini wrote, Barclays' global aggregate bond index is down 5% in the two weeks ended Thursday, November 17th. It's worst such drop since March 2003. More than $77 billion in assets are benchmarked to the index. It incorporates investment-grade debt denominated in 24 currencies. Sovereign bonds have historically been the index's most heavily weighted constituent. The sell-off accelerated aggressively after Donald Trump won the U.S. presidential election. The sell-off was predicated on the notion that Trump's campaign promises to rebuild America's infrastructure, cut taxes, etc. We've already read that. So this is Shun's take on this premature anticipation of the long-awaited breakout of gold. Today's rising interest rates not only predict higher borrowing costs for sovereign bonds, but also the long-awaited and final breakout of gold. After gold's spectacular rise in the summer of 2011 during the EU sovereign bond crisis, central bankers moved to ensure that gold did not threaten their Ponzi scheme of credit and debt. And with a combination of negative gold lease rates and paper gold futures, central banks drove down the price of gold down from its September 2011 high of 1920 to its 2015 low of 1150. But in 2016, central bankers are far weaker due to their costly and long-running efforts to rescue their credit and debt Ponzi scheme from deflation's growing sinkhole of low demand and even lower growth. And today's interest rates threatens the foundation of their fraudulent fiefdom as nothing else does. The world's central banks not only now own record amounts of government debt, the value of that debt, if marked to market, is significantly lower than nominally priced, And if interest rates rise, central banks' balance sheets could be wiped out, resulting in the bankruptcy of central banks themselves. In 2016, rising interest rates caused January's multi-trillion dollar sell-off in global stock markets, as well as November's trillion dollar rout in bond markets. The prediction of even higher interest rates next year means more significant losses in the financial markets in 2017. The banker's 300-year-old Ponzi scheme of credit and debt is ending. We're now in capitalism's third stage, what Hyman Minsky called the Ponzi stage, where borrowers pay what they owe only to be borrowing more, e.g. the U.S. Treasury bond market. There is no fourth stage. The battle between capital and free markets is almost over, and when the bond fire in the bond market has finally run its course, gold and silver will be the victor. So that's the article from uh, Mr. Shun. A pretty pretty good take on that. Now I wanted to show you some of the bond charts here. The first one I wanted to show you is from the Finviz uh, site and this one goes back to 1993 which is very good because uh, that uh, 1994 bond route is a signif- was a significant route and one that people still talk about today. So, But the first thing I want to point out to you here is that I mentioned that the 2008 crisis was not... uh, Some people use the analogy of entering a hurricane and that uh, the 2008 financial crisis was the uh, going into the hurricane and we're currently in the eye and then we're going to exit and get hit again. I don't believe that's the case. And I think that this bond market chart proves that. You can see the reaction in the chart was just a continuation of the bull market. In other words, they just printed more money. It wasn't a crisis like we had in 1994 where rates backed up very, very rapidly. Now, this doesn't appear to be that large of a move, 
relatively speaking, but it was a pretty large move because uh, a significant percentage drop. But uh, the 2000 crisis that happened with the dot-com bust, you can see that was a big move from almost 90 down to 45 or so. So the bond market was cut in half back there. And uh, that, that's a big percentage move. Now, we haven't had anything like that. The financial crisis didn't appear to be anything like that. But you can see that already that we have a move that could be verging on historic moves here in the bond market. And if you look at this little indicator here, you can see that we're looking similar to this area right here. And you can see that the way these indicators came together uh, that indicated the big drop and that's exactly where we are on this chart so history could be repeating we could be repeating something like this now we all know that the price of bonds is inverse to the rates so as the price of bonds go up the rates go down as the price of bonds go down the rates go up that's really important for two reasons. The first reason it's important is because when the bond market tanks, even though uh, interest rates are going up, so bonds are a better buy, that's really the new bonds that are coming out at that new rate. What that does is that makes the old bonds worth less. They're marked down. So uh, you can have a tremendous loss of capital in existing bonds because the new bonds are worth so much more because their rate is so much higher. So that's one effect. The second effect is that when you have uh, rising rates and uh, you've had a tremendous bull market in stocks, then when rates get high enough, investors begin to be tempted back into the bond market um, and out of the stock market. Now. Obviously, investors have been in the bond market for a long time, but as those new bonds come out with those higher rates, uh, then it becomes tempting to start to chase that yield. And that can have a disastrous effect on the stock market. So a decline in the bond market can presage a decline in the stock market. Now, I wanted to jump over to the uh, muni bonds here and uh, show you the charts there. Uh, the muni bonds are municipal bonds, which are bonds that are issued by uh, city governments and uh, governments other than the federal government. And uh, these are entities that don't have the ability to print money. They're not connected to the Federal Reserve, although we don't know what kind of garbage the Federal Reserve has on its balance sheet. It may have municipal bonds but you can see on these charts here that the municipal interest the interest rates on municipal bonds have been unbelievably low uh, you can see for 2016 uh, some of the low rates are down around 2.75 percent now that's a ridiculously low rate on a municipal bond that is really only supported by the ability to tax uh, the residents of that municipality but you can see here with the last 24 month chart, how big the spike up is in rates on muni bonds. And muni bonds can tend to lead the rest of the bond market because uh, treasuries are much safer because they're guaranteed by the government. So muni bonds, on the other hand, uh, they're based on the solvency of that particular entity they're less likely to be bailed out. They're, they're less uh, guaranteed, we'll say. So an uptick in rates in treasuries can be very disastrous for munis because if, if people see that treasury rates are high and they're relatively safer, then they're going to bail out of the munis and head into the treasuries. We can see that here with the rates following each other. Now, we had a a kind of uh, divergence here that happened around 2011 where the rates on treasuries dropped drastically and it took quite a while for the munis to come down they never really did come down as low where you can see back in the mid 2000s the rates were very close to each other but you can see that muni rates did get low but this snap back up here 
has brought the rates nearly back up to this bottom point, which is actually all the way up where they were before the financial crisis. So this move that we've had here is a significant move in muni bond prices. Now that's going to be really important because these governments were already hearing about uh, Dallas, for example, and even though the ties have been very good for them, they're able to borrow money very cheaply. Uh, they still, governments have a tendency to spend whatever money they have and they never uh, look for a rainy day, save for a rainy day. Uh, so when these rates back up and uh, these governments have to come back into the bond market to refinance uh, whatever they're doing, whether it's projects or even possibly they're even paying um, just their regular costs, that wouldn't surprise me at all. The, pay as you go. Uh, that's the sort of thing that Puerto Rico was doing. But uh, as rates back up, uh, it can become very difficult for these municipalities to raise money and that can lead to a lot of crises. So a drop in bonds can lead to two things. One, a deflationary crash where we get a wipeout of the value of the bonds and therefore a massive loss for anybody holding those bonds but it can also lead to a knock-on effect of a stock market crash where people are chasing into bonds at the new higher yields and they're dumping stocks and especially having the baby boomers retiring uh, we're entering that window where the baby boomers are going to be retiring in larger and larger numbers as we go until we reach the peak of that. And that's going to be them selling assets. And even if they're not selling uh, everything, they may be converting from uh, stocks, which are by all rights looking at this chart overvalued and converting into bonds. So that's a double whammy for stocks if this bond market route continues. Uh, based on the technicalities of this chart, I would say that there's a good chance that we could be looking at uh, a 1999 type of route in the bond market. Uh, remember I predicted that uh, we have the presidential cycle. It's very, very common for politicians to let things fall apart during a transition period. That's what happened during the last two endings of eight-year presidential terms. Uh, we had a collapse at the end of the Clinton term, we had a collapse at the end of the Bush term, and we may be looking at a collapse at the end of the Obama term as the scepter is handed off to Donald Trump, and there's a very good incentive for the powers that be to make him look really, really bad because he made a lot of people look really, really bad when he, against all odds, uh, won uh, with everybody fighting against him. So that could happen. Now the last thing I want to look at is the debt to the penny. You can see that we're getting close to that $20 trillion mark. And uh, interest rates are very, very important here because when you have $20 trillion in debt, if, if you only have interest rates of say 1%, uh, then you know 1% of $20 trillion, that's only $200 billion. But if you're talking about 5%, then you're talking about a trillion dollars in interest. That's just to pay the interest on the debt. What happens if you get 10% interest rates? 10% interest rates are actually not that unusual. I, I believe the long-term average of interest rates is somewhere around 7 or 8%. We've had plenty of periods where we had 10% interest rates. 10% interest rates would give us a two trillion dollar interest payment and we barely raise much more than two trillion dollars in tax revenues so that would be lights out if we get that kind of a bond route uh, to get those kind of interest rates uh, you're talking about this market getting cut in half or more maybe down here so that would be a dramatic crash and I would expect that uh, we would have a lot more fireworks happening uh, that would take attention away from government budgets, we'd have collapses all over the place. But it appears that a bond route is possible. If that is possible, I expect that uh, when that happens, we're going to see a reversal in the stocks following that. And Daryl Shum predicts, and I think he's got a pretty, pretty good uh, reason for predicting, 
we're going to see the precious metals reverse at the same time and then we're finally going to see this thing uh, go the other way and we'll talk to you next time